Irish fairy tale about the meeting between the god Pan and um, his Irish counterpart, whose name has escaped me, Angus. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> um, Angus Og being the god of, if you like, sp spiritual, pure love, and Pan, of course, being the god of every other kind of love. Lust. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and and it's like they have a fight over the flower of Irish womanhood, who's Caitlin, who's um, who's sitting over there, and. It's very much a story, a modern, modern commentator think it's very much a story about the place of women in Irish society at the time. There are all sorts of female characters who crop up all the way through it. They have varying degrees of power and independence and various characters and what seems to come out of the story is that they can all be very powerful women regardless of what their situation is and what their character is and what their relationship to men is, they all have the potential to be very powerful women. And it's a, it really is an amazing story, and I highly recommend you read it. Um, it is available, it's out of copyright. And my plan, when I started out at least, was to create a lot of illustrations and publish an illustrated copy. Um, because the text is available online. You can download it from various places on the internet and, and read it if you don't want to pay Penguin for it. <laughs> Uh, even if it's still in print, I don't even know if it's still in print. But, but they're, they're, so there we, we're coming now to the, the digital content of that 50% of the product. And it is that many, many texts are available online, clear charge, because the copyright has expired. Um, and that's a very recent thing that's happened. Uh, a few years ago, you wouldn't have been able to get the text of a book unless you opened the book and typed it out yourself or put it through a scanner and an OCR program. Even if it was copyright expired, how would you get a hold of the text? Now, thousands, hundreds of thousands of texts, of uh, public domain texts, are being collected together in various places on the internet, the notable one being the Gutenberg Project, which simply takes the text in simple format of every single work they can lay their hand on, the crop of gold being one of them. Um, so I started out with the idea that I would um, have an illustration project that would be um, based on the crop I've got. And I went to the Arts Council and I said, I've got this project and would you like to have a look at my work and what do you think about it? And the guy who I talked to at the Arts Council found another website which I had online, which was all based on digital abstract, uh, sort of organic shapes and forms that I created on the computer. And he said, well, yeah, this project sounds very interesting, but I'm really interested in this stuff as well. And of course, there we had a second strand to the project, which also has digital um, computer connections. So this thing here was an organic form created in the computer, which I then printed out and used as a photographic reference. So I might use a photograph of some creature that I've taken in the woods or something like that. Mm. So I'm inventing things to draw. And that's, that is the other strand of the project. And um, you can see over here the, um, the picture of the flying machine to escape the bank manager. <laughs> Sadly it didn't work. Nobody's bought it yet. <laughs> but the machine itself is again created in a three-dimensional um, fractal generation program on the computer and then turned into something that's much more like a traditional artwork. It reminded me of Leonardo. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, that was my know. idea. I mean, I love Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. So we're looking, we're looking at influences for all this. Yeah. That's, that was what I was coming on to. So the first one is Leonardo. Um, there was actually one which was based on a Leonardo drawing and that's yeah. one I've sold. Um, yeah. But um, the others are, in, in a certain amount, a similar style. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we'll come on to techniques in a minute as well. I don't want this to be an incredibly formal lecture, by the way, so just ask if you want to ask anything. Um, and I'm not going to go on forever and ever, because the work looks good and I'll look at the pictures. So, you can definitely see some Leonardo <coughs> flying machine influence in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think also in some of the, the more... Um, I mean, this actually could be a Leonardo illustration. It's actually um, based on an, 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 an engraving from the original.
that it's um, a sort of hypothetical Renaissance man who's documenting and cataloguing the world around him, and it's not our quite our world. It's a, mm -hmm. a little bit sideways and strange. Um, I, I, when I say I, you know, one of my great influences was Will Delay and Nardo in this, in this project. The other one was this guy. We can pass this around and have a look. For anyone who's not in, familiar with him, Ernst Haeckel was um, a scientific illustrator in the 1930s. And he produced these fantastic illustrations, which you've probably seen around, mm -hmm. of uh, microscopic uh, animals plants, um, everything from plankton and, you know, sort of diatoms like this, up to, up to lizards and, and so forth. But what you can see is they're not really in the style of scientific illustrations, because he was highly influenced by the Art Nouveau moment, and he figured that if he was going to make exacting, scientifically accurate illustrations of these strange things that he was seeing on the microscope, he might as well do it with style. And that is an aesthetic that very much appeals to me. That's where this kind of thing comes from. Um, so now I'm, I'm illustrating non-existent creatures with style. <laughs> using techniques that were being used in the Re Renaissance. So when you talk about the you know, Vinci like this um, sort of thing here, these are the materials that he would have used. Um, I, had to cheat and cut some corners. I tried using dip pen with real sepia ink, and it really, really is a hassle. You have to do it so slow. So, out of the two strands we started out with, I picked the one which I'm kind of find the most stimulating to carry on. Hence the reason the prop build, unfortunately, is still finished. But I'll publish it eventually. <laughs> I will publish my illustrated edition eventually. But this kind of stuff um, and that, those are the kinds of things I'm working on at the moment. And um, so I'm continuing to create some new organic forms and machine kind of industrial forms and blending them together and making strange contraptions. And it's gradually kind of start mulling over, yeah, but what does it all mean? And what's the, what is the symbolism? What's the significance of it all? And very often when, when um, we're trying to decode an artwork, I think what, what works best for the people who are looking at a piece of art is when somebody actually doesn't tell them what it's all about, but when it's actually quite obvious what it's all about, the combination of looking at the picture and reading the title, I think should kind of tell you what the picture is about. I'm not a keen on the kind of art where the only means anything if the artist explains it. Exactly. I'm <laughs> Tracy Amin being chasing point. I mean, I didn't understand anything Tracy Amin did at all. And it was totally beyond me until I went to see a retrospective at the Hayward Gallery and there were reams and reams of text explaining what it's all about. Oh, right! <laughs> okay, it's all about her childhood and it's all about her upbringing, it's all about her romantic history or lack of it and etc, etc, etc. And now I get it. Okay, now I understand. Um, but I never would have if I hadn't had it explained to me in some form. Um, so now I'm starting embarking this path of creating whole new body paintings which are based on organic and mechanical machinery blended in some way. With a human presence, like we see the bank manager there, who's also an iron on transfer <laughs> from an old French uh, um, photograph. Um, and I think the, the symbolism has to be quite simple, but not, it's not like, it doesn't treat you as if you're stupid, but it has to be not too complex. And I think what I'm coming up with gradually now is this process by which. The pictures I'm doing contain literal machinery of some sort, but they are symbolizing uh, conceptual machinery. The machinery behind what we do day to day. The machinery behind how the state operates. The machinery behind 
how the disability system operates, the shadowy things that happen behind the scenes. I mean, there are strings here, I well, we can't see that. There are strings here connecting bits of machinery, and in the paintings I'm doing now, most of which are still in here, um, the strings are manipulating people. There is one, for instance, where um, Vivian Marie is walking on a tightrope, and underneath the tightrope there's all this machinery, which is kind of pushing and pulling at the rope, but you don't know whether it's trying to support her or it's trying to dislodge her. And this is because we have sort of, you know, sort of this it, society at the moment has this strange relationship with people who have a disability. Is the machinery trying to support them or is it trying to put them, throw them off? And it seems it's very difficult to tell. And I think the ambiguity in painting is going to make it very difficult to tell. Is this person being a supported? Is there things coming up in front of this rope to support it as she's trying to make her way along it, or is they, are they shaking side to side and trying to shake her off? Um, I don't know, that's just a simple example of, sort of some simple symbolism that's coming into it. I'm sure it's going to get a lot more abstruse. Um, um, obscure as time goes on, but hopefully not so obscure that people won't get it. And the uh, result of that is, as I say, I've just started this um, series of paintings. They're due to be finished around this time next year. Well, actually, they have to be finished earlier than that. But the first exhibition will be in July, January, February, next, February, I think, next year. And that will be in Cambridge and Wells. And I will be continuing that series of paintings. So there are four exhibitions planned for that year, one of which will be here, one in Kandrindor, one in the Whiteside Centre, and one at Mona in Macanthus. And <coughs> they'll all be part of the same project, and they'll all be part of the same concept, but I have done different exhibitions. So try and get to all of them. Okay. I guess that's probably <laughs> enough talking. So does anyone have questions? This is the most kind of symbolic of what's happening next. Mm. So, so it's taking this kind of thing, there's this kind of machine, shadowy machinery of some kind, gears and cogs and wheels and levers and strings, and they are being combined with um, figures who are going about their everyday business in some way. And, but they are going to be spectacular large oil paintings. Um, and, uh, I hope that's going to have a lot of impact. That it's going, people are going to look at it and think, "Well, that's kind of all right." I can see what he's saying there. You know, <laughs> I mean, I have a couple of couple of objectives when I'm, when I'm painting, um, artistic objectives, I suppose. One is, if I put a painting on the wall, it's that sort of size. If you see it from over there, you should be you should be immediately saying, "What the heck is that?" I've got to go and have a look at it. I've got to have a closer look. And then it draws people in. Mm. I don't want a painting that sits in the corner and people can maybe notice now and then. Um, it's all got to be something that draws people in and makes intrigues people. Intrigue is the what I'm aiming mm. for. Really. And the other objective is when they do look at it and see the content, is what is that all about? I've got to not want straight away, want to know what it's about. And it's all about drawing people and engaging people's in imagination, mm. intelligence. Um, there's an awful lot of art we see, and art hangs things like in inverted commas there, really, which is decorative. Um, I'm not really interested in just decorative. It's kind of, this is the last, the illustration work I've done here is the last guy in dying gasp of my decorative phase, <laughs> which means that doesn't mean I can't do everything de anything decorative from now on, but it does mean it's going to be at least as meaningful as it is, as it is decorative. Mm. And there's a story behind that. Uh, what, two, three years ago? Um, 2011, I was shortlisted for a competition which was run by British Airways, uh, which was called Great Britons. And the art part of the competition was aiming to find an artist to design 
livery for uh, aircraft to that were going to be used, their little fleet of aircraft that was going to be used to ferry in competitors to the Olympic Games in 2012. So if you look very carefully, you might find some <laughs> familiar shapes in here. <laughs> so I came up with a, um, a, a little portfolio of potential designs, um, which I used uh, this computer software to generate. And I got shortlisted out of several hundred entrants into the last day. Oh, well done. Well done, yeah. And um, so the last ten of us went to the Royal Academy in London for interview and were interviewed by a panel which was Tracy Eamon, Eliza Bonham Carter, who is a um, distant cousin of Helena mm -hmm. and is a curator of paintings at the Royal Academy. Uh, the CEO of British Airways and the guy who's in charge of painting all their aircraft and their senior HR director. And uh, so there was this panel interview where I had to present these designs. Needless to say, sadly, I didn't win in the end. Um, I'm a bit miffed because the guy that did win, I don't know if you saw the winning design, it was, it was gold and sort of, it was meant to be dove piece. Uh, and it was a graphic designer from London who happened to be at the Royal College of Art at the same time. Furniture designer, actually. Yeah, oh, right. <laughs> Which seemed a bit <laughs> odd. Sorry. Furniture designer. He was designer, yeah. 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 But uh, he's the one, he's, he was the one who ran it. But um, at some point, and, and Tracy Eamon was sitting in this little row of people behind the table and looking like she really didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, she looked like she had the worst hangover in the entire universe. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. she might well have. <laughs> and uh, at some point she did, she picked up, I gave everybody a copy of this portfolio, she picked it up and she had a look and she went, and, and looking at the, the digital design on which that drawing was based, the original digital design, she picked it up and said, you know what, if I saw a plane on the runway with that on it, I wouldn't get in it because it looks like plane cash already, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I was inspired to take the original design and make this drawing of it, and it's called that Tracy Evans. So far, it looks like a plane crash. Have you just sent her a copy? Not yet. So that's the story of that. That's about the end of my story. Um, please go around and have a look at all the pictures if you've got any questions.